Good morning, everyone. You glad to be in God's house today? So good to see you on a July Sunday. I uh, told the 9 a.m. service, just row after row of families and even opening up the corners at 9 a.m. service. Everyone says in July, people just don't go to church. They're traveling. They're gone. And uh, 9 o'clock just blew my mind. And to come in and see all of you here at 1045, just so glad you're in God's house today. Amen. There's something special about being in his presence. And for those who are traveling, uh, who are out of town, uh, just want to let you know I'm so glad you're able to join us online. I hope you do have good vacations, make memories with your family. Those are moments that matter. Uh, and several other names that jumped out to me, not just those traveling, but the Hublers. I uh, continue to pray for you, Barb. I love you so much. Uh, the Schneider family, the Knights, the Gaddis family shared with us online just now. Your family's sick uh, and praying for your family uh, that God will just let all of you feel better soon for healing. Uh, and then another name that just jumped out to me, Mark uh, Morin, who is away in Fort Still, Oklahoma. Uh, and Mark, thank you for all of your years prior serving our country. Uh, and now even again uh, in how God is using you in this season of your life. But to all of those who serve our country, I'm glad. Uh, everyone that is online today, welcome, welcome, welcome. And StorySide, not only can we welcome those online, but can we appreciate those who serve our country and just let them know how much that we value that as well. I, this has nothing to do with my message, but this week I was getting ready. I've shared before about my Hyundai, uh, my son when I do chaplaincy, and I'm actually meeting one of the players tomorrow and, and have a, a wedding this month I'm officiating, but my son loves the players' cars. And he'll be like, and dad, we have a Hyundai. I love my Hyundai. But uh, this week I, I get in my car, Angel's with me, and uh, we get ready to drive down the road and I'm barely on 13 and going and I hear it making a noise uh, in the car. And so several times I'm like, man, what in the world? Thankfully, I still have some warranty left on it, but I, I can hear the noise. And so I ask Angel, I'm like, babe, listen for this noise. And a couple of times she heard it. And so I call the dealership and the guy tells me on the phone, he's like, with uh, that vehicle, we have had some strut issues. Maybe that's what it is. Um, and so uh, he can't get me in immediately, but he gives me a date and a time, which was Friday. And he said, if you could come in first thing Friday, we'll take a look at it. And so I take it in Friday morning and the tech gets in the car with me and we drive up and down. He hears the noise a couple of times. We're trying to figure it out, but thankfully, uh, before we send it in the back, because he's telling me it could take three or four hours, I'm not even sure we have all the parts uh, in for that to, to fix the strut or whatever. Uh, but thankfully, before it actually even got sent back, um, he was able to find a can of Zevia under my seat. Uh, <laughs> so embarrassing uh, that when I would hit the brakes, this thing was bumping up against something, making a noise. So everyone, advice for today, check under your seats, everybody. Check, so embarrassing. Uh, my, my wife told me, she's like, babe, that's actually good news. I'm like, not really. I know those people, two or three of them. The one guy says he watches online or something. I'm like, I am so embarrassed right now. Um, so anyway, my car's fine. I love my Hyundai. Uh, my car's fine, everybody. <laughs> God help us. I want to talk to you in our time together today on something that a few weeks ago, I just felt the Holy Spirit just dropped in my spirit about tents and camping in Scripture. And they would live in tents, they would move, they would travel. There's a lot of stories about it, believe it or not. And a couple of weeks ago, I started reading and studying it and just immediately became inundated with multiple stories in Scripture about their tense, if you would. And so I want to start talking today and maybe share for a week or two or three, I'm not sure, but I want to start talking today and just share with you what, what I believe God put on my heart. Now, I know that their camping thousands of years ago much different than our camping 
as we know it. How many today in the room, just by show of hands, uh, you camp? You are campers, you, you've done camp. Just raise your hand up high. Uh, Nine o'clock had a lot more campers than what I, what I expected. How many of you are hotel people, like camping is not your option, hotel people? Um, they say, matter of fact, if you, if you read this, some people say, and I don't even know why, but they don't use the word camping anymore. Uh, to be politically correct, which I feel like nowadays everything people say has to be politically correct, but to call it outdoor adventures. Uh, but we're just going to go with camping. Uh, t today we'll go with camping. But they say with camping that it's basically donating blood one mosquito at a time. I've heard other people say that camping is great uh, for when you are craving a horrible night's sleep. Someone else shared that going camping is the perfect reminder of how great life is when you're not camping. <laughs> but I've also, I've also read that camping is where you spend a small fortune uh, to live like a homeless person. <laughs> That's not funny, but I didn't say it. I didn't say it. Someone said it. Uh, I also, because the Coopers, uh, if you know the Coopers, great family here in our church. Ashley is full-time here at the church. Her son Keaton uh, is full-time. Keaton works back in the booths with the, the cameras and the tech side of it. And Keaton's super funny. If you've met Keaton, he's 17 and has helped us for years now and just more and more involvement. Uh, the Cooper family loves camping. They actually went camping um, all last week. And they were sharing with me that Keaton, who's 17, uh, they were doing karaoke one night. I think, Andy, you were there, right, for the karaoke? Um, and all these people, I, I, I've watched two videos now, but all these people were at karaoke. And the guy from the front invites Keaton to come sing karaoke. And I didn't even know. Keaton always works in the back. I didn't know. You're going to see him on the stage soon. But I didn't know that was one of the giftings he had. Uh, but they, they shared with me that uh, the parents, Josh and Ashley, turned to look at, Ke Josh looks at Keaton, he's already walking to the front. Uh, and so Keaton goes to the front for karaoke at the campground, and he sang the song, Stacy's Mom Has Got It Going On, right? Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't just, it wasn't just that Keaton sang the song, Stacy's Mom Has Got It Going On. Keaton in the microphone says, I want to dedicate this song to all of the single moms out there. <laughs> and not even that the dedication was enough. Keaton then says, I am two months from turning 18. <laughs> and here is my phone number, 419, and shares with the campground his phone number. And then proceeded to crush the song Stacy's mom so if you would let's just all stretch our hands towards Keaton in the back and let's just say a prayer for Keaton but for people like the Coopers uh, who say a lot of people have said this to me that camping is a family tradition have you ever heard that people say camping sort of like a family tradition the reality is that it actually was a tradition for all of us until we came up with homes. <laughs> but <laughs> I want to talk to you in the next 20 minutes as we think about camping. I want to talk to you on this subject. What place would you pick? What place would you pick? If you were able to go camping, where is the place? What does that look like for you? What place would you pick? Maybe some of you would say, I see a, a fifth wheel, or I see it in an RV, or you know, Dr. Brad and others shared with me they love the all-in-one, all the bells and whistles, uh, you know, just traveling place to place. Other people like, like Jay, who shared with me that he is camped in the outdoors, I believe it was Colorado, and literally will take a sleeping bag, and I mean for real camping. One of my favorite camping trips was when I went fishing in the Boundary Waters nor in northern Minnesota, the Boundary Waters of the U.S. and Canada, and they won't let any 
uh, glass, nothing powerized, motorized in there. So we were putting food in uh, Ziploc baggies. Your clothes had to be in, in watertight bags. They drop you off. You have a canoe. You're there for a week. The fishing was unbelievable. Some of our group loved it. I did love it. Some of our group hated it. Uh, there was no cell phone reception and Maybe that would be something that would intrigue you. Other people that would say, you know, I want to go to Mohican um, or, or you have a favorite spot. You have several families here in our church uh, that will talk about how they love going out west and, and that is their thing, the parks. And... But if, if you were to ask yourself this question in the natural, uh, what, what place, where is the place that you would pick if you could... If you could camp. Now I know that scriptures are not sharing stories about camping as we know it. We're not going to open the Bible today and read about Keaton at karaoke. I get that. This was sort of a way of life for them. But I hope God's word will speak to you like it's been speaking to me the last few weeks. So let's pray together. God, I'm just asking on site and online that you would allow your word, your spirit to speak to your people. I pray that you would help me to share what you need, what you want them to hear. I pray that you would anoint me. I promise you, I promise you I'll give you all the glory. Bless every church in our region, our area, and around the world. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to read to you today out of Genesis chapter number 13. Beginning to read at verse number five, during this time, Lot was also traveling with Abram. Now, if we stopped right here, if this was our camping message of the day, one family is traveling with another family and they have all kinds of animals. Do you see that? I mean, that's a message in and of itself. Has anyone ever taken a trip with people and you get on the trip and you're like, what was I thinking? Why did I do this? Did I? Yes. I, I want you just to see that, that they're traveling together. They have all kinds of animals and tents. I've heard it said, how do you get everyone excited about a family reunion? You tell them it's been canceled. <laughs> no, that's not funny. No, it's not. He has many animals and tents. Verse 6 says, Abram and Lot had so many animals that the land could not support both of them together. So we're not even talking a small amount. I just want you to see that there's a lot. They had so many. The Canaanites and the Perizzites were also living in this land at the same time. The shepherds of Abram and Lot began to argue. So Abram said to Lot, there should be no arguing between you and me or between your people and my people. We are brothers. We should separate. You can choose. This is our message today. Abram, or as we know, Abraham tells his nephew, you can choose any place. Mohican, Montana, Boundary Waters, Colorado. Now I know it's their story, but he says you can choose any place that you want. If you go to the left, I will go to the right. If you go to the right, I will go to the left. So Lot looked, and he saw the whole Jordan Valley. He saw that there was much water there. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. At that time, the Jordan Valley all the way to Zoar was like the Lord's garden. This was a good land like the land of Egypt. So Lot chose to live in the Jordan Valley. The two men separated, and Lot began traveling east. Abram stayed in the land of Canaan. Lot lived among the cities in the valley. Lot moved as far as Sodom and, and we say it together, made his, made his camp there. The Lord knew, this is so interesting to me, the Lord knew that the people of Sodom were evil sinners. So Lot doesn't pick a place and then it happens. He picks a place and the Lord knew. Lord knew. The King James Version says this in Genesis 13, Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and we say this together, he pitched, 
he pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. When you read this story, we see right from the start that there is Jenny accumulation. There is seemingly success. There are all kinds of things that have what we would call maybe blessings or favor. Or the words that the Bible are going to use is been that there's so much and so many. So much and Harvey so many. They have all of these things and because of the things if you look at the progression of these scriptures, Matthew, it's going to go this. Stuff. They had so much stuff, everyone couldn't get along. The stuff then causes the shepherds to start arguing. And then the shepherds end up causing a division with Abraham and Lot. But it all starts with the stuff. Now we know that the end of this story is going to spill over all the way to the New Testament. Jesus, our Savior, is going to say in the New Testament, remember Lot's wife. It's the second shortest verse in the Bible. Second to Jesus wept. But the story I just read you, stuff, shepherds, and now an uncle telling a nephew, pick a place, is going to make it page after page, book after book, all the way to the New Testament, with Jesus saying, you need to remember Lot's wife. Because this decision and this choice, where he pitched his tent towards Sodom, this decision and choice right here, is going to affect Lot's spouse, his children. Matter of fact, at one part of the story, there's such sexual sin that there are people, same-sex kind of situations, that are actually trying at that time in a home or an abode, they're trying to get out angelic visitors, visitation, trying to get them out into the streets of Sodom. All of that Starts with a decision about stuff that made its way to shepherds to pick a place to pitching a tent. Now in our time together, I don't want to just point out the decision or the choice of Lot without first asking you and I, what does wealth do to me? So many, so much. This is why Lot pitches his tent here. What does wealth do to me? Now if you have, if you have a lot of animals, right? If you have a lot of animals, Peyton, think about this. Is anyone going to blame you for wanting a place that has a lot of water? If you have a lot of animals, Gary, who would blame someone for looking out, seeing a bunch of greenery, and being like, perfect. What we notice in this story is that we don't seem to find at any point that Lot sought counsel or advice not only from his uncle, but even from God. If you read further down in the same chapter, you're going to see that when Abram picks the leftover, the remaining, one of the first things he does is builds an altar. So you have Uncle Abram that is making a decision, a choice, and including God. And it would sure seem like you have a nephew Lot making a decision, a choice, and not 
including God? When we read these verses of Scripture and we ask ourselves, what does wealth do to me? You have these men, so many and so much, but what about you and I in 2023? What does wealth do to me? Maybe someone would say, Micah, it stresses me out. I've met people who get stressed out about it. Maybe you would say, I worry about money. Worry about how I'm going to make ends meet. Worry about if there's enough in retirement. Worry about how I'm going to, my children, my grandchildren. I'm just asking you, before we point our finger at Lot, and we see the outcome of this story, his children messed up, his wife turning into a pillar of salt, everything that falls apart in his family. Before we look at that too quickly, let's just ask ourselves today, what does wealth do to me? Some people will hoard it or hide it. There's a property right here up the street where people have told me over the years I've been on the property. People will tell me that the gentleman didn't trust financial advice, advisors, didn't trust oversight. And maybe some of you are like, I don't either. Like Anymore nowadays, you wonder who you can trust, right? But just up the road, they, they said that he took all kinds of monies and gold coins and stuff and buried it on his property. I've heard people say like they almost like expect or hope that they uncover some as they go on the property. But there are people who will hide or hoard or hold on to. There are other people who will lie or cheat. When we ask ourselves the question, what does wealth do to me? Some people will lie and cheat. You're like, I didn't come to church in July. I was one of the ones that, I didn't come to hear about taxes today, Micah, but the reality is, some people lie and cheat when it comes to wealth. Some people will treat money like it's an at all cost thing. They'll climb over people, jobs, businesses. They'll cut people in the back. They'll do business deals. You know, they'll cut corners. They'll relationships will be severed all because of because of wealth because of money people will get their priorities out of order just this week i was talking to i preached a college conference this week and it was actually amazing they they thought there was about seven or eight hundred college students there i don't know the number but just seeing them loving Jesus and worshiping Jesus, and it was an honor to, to speak to them. But in several conversations this week with a couple of younger people, they, they were around 20 years old, 22 years old, but several different conversations that I was a part of where they would say things like, how quick can I get to six figures? I love drive and vision and passion and all those things. I'm just saying from a young age, if we're not careful, we can start to have our priorities thinking, I'll be happy when, when what? I'll be happy when I get a car. I'll be happy when I get a second car. And then we get the second car, but then we're like, well, I'll be happy when I get, and then when we get this, we're now saying we'll be happy when we get that. I think when we ask ourselves the question, what does wealth do to me? I think there is a hunger that is rarely satisfied. I think wealth, I think wealth can stir up anger. I think wealth can stir up hurt. You say, how is that possible, Micah? Well, just think in life, how many times you've heard people say, I never thought they would get the promotion. I never thought they would get the raise. I thought it was my turn. And, and they'll say things like that. As a pastor, I don't know in 33 plus years of ministry that I have watched more family division 
as what I have watched when it comes to wealth. Families that would cook out together, holidays together, spend time together, until they were dividing up guns or inheritance or insurance monies or land. Now some of those same families, there's no hamburger, there's no hot dog, there's no exchanging of gifts. A lot of them have unfriended, unfollowed. I just want you to notice today that before we point the finger too quick at what Lot done, sometimes that same wealth has a way of influencing you and I. What does wealth do to me? Investments and 401ks. and Sometimes we could check our investments more than we would even check God's Word. Like every day I've got to see, is it up or down? But sometimes I miss, give us this day my daily bread. The Bible says that when we seek after these things to a fault, they're actually like arrows that pierce our soul. Now we know the stuff, the shepherds, the uncle, the nephew, and all of a sudden we're pitching a tent. The reality is, Abram and Lot separate over something and someone else. And verse 9 says that Abram tells him, you choose, you pick a place. Now as I wrap this up today, I really would like you to see that there doesn't seem to be any counsel, any direction. It's a decision that is based off of the water, the greenery. It looks like what Lot has is determining the place he's going to pick. Maybe we all have a little lot in us. The decision that's made as we wrap this up, it, it's what I wrote down in my notes. Never used this term before, but I just wrote down the words environmental excuses. What I mean by that is Nobody is going to blame Lot in the moment for picking a place with water and greenery because Johnny has so much stuff, Robbie has so much stuff that it would make sense. It's a good place. I'm going to pick a place. I'm going to pitch my tent. In these moments of environmental excuses. While on one hand, it's telling us water and green grass. On another hand, it's saying that there is exceeding sin. There's wickedness. And God knew about it. When you think about this choice that was made, Lot, maybe known or unknown, is putting himself in a bad place, a bad predicament, and pitches his tent towards Sodom. Who could have ever known that the decision that day would result in Wife, children, relationships. Let me ask you this as we get ready to pray. Just think about these questions. I have been preaching this message to myself for a few weeks. I hope the Holy Spirit will just talk to your heart for a moment. Think about these questions. Where am I positioning my soul? Where am I positioning my soul? Now I know it's not a tent. I know that. I know we are not living in this type of a setup. I get it. But if you were just to ask yourself today, 
Where am I positioning my soul? When it comes to my decisions, my choices, my priorities, maybe someone else might be more fitting for you to say, where am I positioning my family? In the moment, it seems little. If we don't read the rest of the story, if we don't turn all the way to the New Testament where Jesus Christ would say, remember Lot's wife, if we don't do all of that, if we just read, it's crowded, it's congested, people are arguing, there's drama, and we're like, you know what? I'm going to make a decision. This is where I'm going. It actually doesn't seem like a lot. But the devil who is a master at a little leaven, or what the Bible would call little foxes, it doesn't seem like a lot to pitch my tent here until we turn the page. It doesn't seem like a lot to pitch my tent here until we go to the end of the story, or until we look at the New Testament, and then all of a sudden we see the ramifications, the consequences of a decision that was made in a day, of this is the place I want to pick. I know it's not Montana, and I know it's not Colorado, and it's not Mohican, or it's not the Boundary Waters. For him, it was Sodom. But let me ask you today, where are you pitching your soul? Where are you positioning your family? Because in the moment, it may not even seem like a big deal. Pastor Micah, you know, I have people tell me this all the time. One thing about being in an area for 20 some years is you're able to see, I literally have done weddings now for people I dedicated. Just when you're in an area for a while, you watch kids that you dedicated. Now they're graduating. Now they're in college. Now they're grown up. I look around the room. I see many of you in the room right now. And over the years, I have watched as families, I'll just give you an example. Anyone that knows me knows I love sports. I do chaplaincy. I'm meeting a, a player tomorrow, doing one of their weddings in, in two weeks. I love chaplaincy. I love sports. My kids play sports. But as an example, we could pitch our tent towards being so busy with just sports. And it seems in the moment like it's nothing. Nothing. Pastor Mike is some water and green grass. But I have watched, this is one of the things just 20 some years, is I have watched families then ask me when their kid is 18 or 20 or doesn't want to go to church or doesn't want to be around the things of God. Pastor Micah, pr please pray for my son. Pastor Micah, please pray for my daughter. And if we were honest, we could backtrack back to when they were six, seven, eight, nine. And we want now for it to be a priority when it wasn't a priority then. And hear my heart, that, it's not a sports point, it could be a money point, it could be a sleep in point, it could be I've got a mo point, it could be any point. But if we're not careful, we pitch our tent towards things that we don't realize in the moment, the consequence that is going to play out in time. We could pitch our tent towards a lot of things. He pitched his tent towards sin. Sin. It's an environmental excuse. The green grass outweighs the sin. The water outweighs the wickedness. And we, we justified. It's an environmental excuse. I know I go there on Fridays. I know I do that on Saturday. I know it's my buddies. I probably shouldn't watch it. I probably shouldn't go. I, but you know what? We went to high school together. We start giving environmental excuses. But hear my heart, heart today. The Holy Spirit has been speaking to me for several weeks now. We have to be careful about the position and the places we are picking because sometimes we don't realize in the moment what it is going to do to us in the long term let me ask you this question and I wrote it down in my notes this is not just pastor Micah this is even dad Micah I wrote down what will the future of my family look like if my, if I pitch my tent here what will the future of my family look like if I pitch my tent here 2 Peter 2 says this, 
and turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them and overthrew them and made them an example. So it wasn't just about what happened then. The Bible says it's an example for the future. Why of all the things Jesus could say, he doesn't say, you know, remember Sarah. He doesn't say, remember Rebecca. He doesn't say, remember Esther. Why would Jesus say, remember Lot's wife? You know how much time has elapsed? This verse of Scripture here, He's taken us back to say this was an example. And he then tells us that Lot, who was delivered but was vexed, how? Because of unclean conversation. For he being righteous and dwelling among them and seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day, not with his unlawful deeds. He vexed himself with, with their unlawful deeds. In other words, it's not just about what I'm doing. It's about when I position my tent in places that are surrounded by what everyone else is doing. Now we have his wife as a pillar of salt. We have his daughters who end up with all kinds of emotional baggage. And one of the saddest parts of the story, and I feel burdened even sharing it today, but one of the saddest parts of the story is when he goes here, what does he have? You said it with me. What does he have when he goes there? So much. So many. All these animals and wealth and accumulation. He's got it all when he goes. What does he have when he leaves? He goes with so much. But he leaves with so little. Pick a place. It matters. Pick a place. The psalmist said this. 84th Psalm, verse number 10. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than, what's it say? I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God. If I've got to make a decision, if I've got to pick a place, I just want to say, this is my choice. I want His presence. I want His power. I want His anointing. I want His Spirit. I want His Word. If I have to pick a place, if you're telling me I've got to decide between this and that, I pick Him. God, I feel the Holy Spirit for someone today. Joel sang the song, turn your eyes. Come on, Lot. Come on, Micah. Come on, Storyside. Turn your eyes toward Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things, the water, the grass. I know it looks good. Sometimes the stuff needs to fade so that I can make sure my heart's in the right place. The main thing is the main thing. The writer reminded us, what would it profit if we had all the stuff, but we lost our soul? You say, Micah, are you against camping? No, I'm not. I actually like the outdoors. You against hunting and fishing? You against me? No, I'm not. I, are you against someone who's 20 wanting to make six figures? No, I had a great conversation with them. You against kids playing sports? No, my kids play sports. I'm simply saying that every one of us needs to be reminded that there is a line that we can cross where we allow 
certain people, places to slip in our priorities and our decisions and our choices, they can get so out of order. And today, if this message is able to speak to you like it's been speaking to me the last few weeks, I don't want to pick a place that puts my family at risk. I want to pick a place that puts my soul at risk. In the moment, it might not even seem like a lot. Grass and water. But God, help me in the moment. Whether I pray prayers of counsel, of advice, for His Word, His Spirit, speak to me, lead me. Whether or not I create disciplines in, in my life that says these are some non-negotiables. Pick a place. It matters. Pick a place. Can we say it together? Pick a place. It matters. So you close your eyes and give me the opportunity to pray with you today. God, I'm so thankful for your word. I'm so thankful for our time of worship today. I love these people. I watch people leaving. I watch people coming in. The kids, teenagers, students. I love these people. And I know that you love them even way more than I do. Help people not to pick places that's positioning them for a fallout, for failures. It's a price they don't want to pay. It's a price I don't want to pay. Please touch your people today. As they sit here, if they have allowed environmental excuses to slip in, if they are justifying things, if there are people, I know it's not an actual tent, but if there are people who have positioned themselves in a direction that they shouldn't be. It could be a direction of bitterness or offense. It could be a direction of racism. It could be a direction of unfair priorities. And there's a lot of ways we could position ourselves in the wrong direction, lukewarmness and being lax. And But just hear my heart, God, if any of us have positioned our tent in a direction, in a way that, that we shouldn't, I pray that you would speak to every one of us right now Help us to seek first the kingdom. Help us to turn our eyes from things. Help us to turn our eyes towards you. I pray for every person from young to old in this room, everyone who's joining us online, let your Holy Spirit, let your love, let your grace and mercy let it speak to us today. If we need to remember Lot's wife today, help us to remember. If we need to remember the power of decisions and choices, help us to remember. If we need to decide as for me in my house, help us to remember today. I thank you for this moment right now. Some of you, why don't you just tell God, I'm picking a place. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in your house. I'd rather be rooted and planted and engaged. I want my family. I want my life. Why don't you just tell them that right now? I pick a place. I pick a place. My place is in your presence. If you're close to someone you love, you may just want to take them by the hand. A husband, a wife, a child. Just pray over your family. I pick a place. If you're praying with your family, maybe even just say it out loud. We pick a place. We pick a place. God, I pray these things in Jesus' name.